In recent years, NVIDIA's GTC event has become mythic in proportion. It's an event where hundreds, if not thousands, of AI researchers, industry experts, and people who want to see what's coming next make the pilgrimage to San Jose, California, where NVIDIA is headquartered, to hear one man speak. And that man is Jensen Wong, the CEO of NVIDIA. This year, there were not just incremental improvements. There were not new rebrands or, or new slight improvements to existing lithography. This year... Jensen announced Blackwell, which is something that's been rumored for nearly two years. Blackwell is named after Harold Blackwell, the mathematician and statistician who pushed mathematics forward. And Blackwell pushes NVIDIA into the next generation. And, and some would say, to the next universe when it comes to what the future of AI is, the future of AI compute, and how we think about compute in general. They showcase not only how this can be used for supercharging LLMs, but envisioning new entire use cases for AI, and they showcased how NVIDIA's infrastructure and NVIDIA's software can help push the state of the art even further than what some of us thought was possible. So even in an ecosystem with competitors like Tesla, with Dojo, with Cerebras, with Grok, NVIDIA is still on top and NVIDIA GPUs still continue to be the most coveted and valuable asset in the hottest new industry, which is AI development and compute. So who is getting these GPUs first? Which players are pushing ahead by building the biggest data centers? What does it mean for you if you couldn't even hope to afford an eighth of one B200? Does this really mean we're getting a 5090 any sooner? Welcome to AI Flux, let's get into it. So at a high level, why should you care about the new Blackwell B200? NVIDIA's new landmark GPU is called the B200, B standing for Blackwell, obviously, and it's massive. It's nearly twice the size of the prior H100 or an H200 GPUs. It's basically the size of a post-it note. And of course, it wouldn't be GTC without a very engaging video of Jensen Huang holding it up with two super built arms um, just to show you the comparison that yes, in fact, to quote the actual keynote, this is the biggest GPU NVIDIA has ever created, and it is in fact bigger than the H100 GPU die, which is sort of funny, but yes, it is actually the biggest GPU they've ever made. It features HBM3E, which is pretty cool. There are a lot of performance numbers I want to get into, but yes, this is what's going into their systems. They also showcased their test rig, which is pretty cool. I actually saw a number of these when I toured NVIDIA's facilities in college. Their test boards are basically the size of like an A4 sheet of paper, if not a bit larger. And what's also cool is you can see how much smaller they made the actual inference boards that they're now using, which feature Again, one of their Grace ARM-based CPUs. Now, one of the biggest rumors surrounding Blackwell was whether or not they were going to switch to a chiplet architecture. And they were a little light on deep technical details of this because it's not really officially in anyone's hands yet. But what's cool is now we know that, yes, they are basically tying together a bunch of sparse GPU cores. And what's interesting is they've seemingly just completely skipped a lot of the issues and engineering challenges that AMD had trying to do this with CPUs where you had limitations of where something in memory was based on what GPU and having that affect certain performance attributes based on how you wanted to run software. So it goes without saying that NVIDIA still sits entirely on top of the throne of the AI and GPU world. Anyone with the data center basically only wants NVIDIA GPUs and more specifically the architecture that wraps NVIDIA's GPUs, which are their switching architecture, their networking architecture that has now been developed downstream of their acquisition of Mellanox, along with their G8 H200 Grace Hopper super chip, also tying together all of this. What's crazy is this basically means that anyone with, you know, a couple hundred or maybe a few billion dollars can put together a supercomputing cluster that requires less space and energy than any time before. And already this chip is in massive demand. I can't really talk about it on this channel, but in theory, a now deleted semi-analysis article that was released just a few hours before this event actually went into quite a bit of detail as to where they think the financials of NVIDIA's production of the B200 are. And there's been also a lot of back and forth as to whether or not NVIDIA is price gouging this GPU just to make a lot of money back from the development costs 
Um, one really interesting tidbit that Jensen did mention is that the very first test board that was shown on stage for the B200 GPUs in theory represents about $10 billion of development and engineering spend over the course of multiple years. And that the second smaller one that is kind of the official board they're releasing represents a eye-watering $5 billion. So clearly, however this is priced will reflect initially what they have to make back. And then at the end of the day, NVIDIA is a company in the business of making money selling GPUs. So for people who are wondering why it couldn't be cheaper, I really don't know what to tell you. So Jensen describes the B200 as a GPU that will provide a massive generational leap in AI computational power. This is the GPU that will now take over from the H100 and H200. There will also be a Blackwell GB200 super chip that will also be the next logical step forward for the Grace ARM-based CPU which is paired again with these new Blackwell GPUs. However, we might not see those until 2025. We think that NVIDIA will probably eventually have consumer class Blackwell GPUs as well, but again, it will probably be past 2025 before we actually see those, which unfortunately doesn't bode well for people hoping that this release would include a lot of information about a 5090, although we have a lot of information about the silicon involved at this point. So for technical details, at a high level, the B200 GPU more than doubles the transistor count of the existing H100. And like always, there are caveats here, but we'll get to that in just a bit. The B200 packs a stunning 208 billion transistors versus 80 billion on the H100 or H200. It provides a stunning 20 petaflops of AI performance from a single GPU. A single H100 for reference had a maximum of four petaflops of AI compute. And last but not least, it will feature 192 gigabytes of HBM3E, offering up to eight terabytes per second of bandwidth. The performance numbers in terms of how many times more powerful or faster this is than the H100 gets kind of interesting, and I will get to that in just a bit. The specifics have to do with training and inference, and there's some wild numbers here. Now for the caveats. So first and foremost, as rumors have indicated, the Blackwell B200 is actually not a single GPU. It's kind of harkening back to the days of the GTX 690. So instead, it's actually two GPUs tightly coupled on a single die. Although they function as a unified CUDA GPU, according to NVIDIA, the chips are linked via a 10 terabyte per second NVHBI or NVIDIA High Bandwidth Interface Connection to ensure they can properly function as a single fully coherent chip. And frankly, for the people who are here for the hard tech details, this is incredible because this is a problem that took AMD nearly half a decade to solve with CPUs. And with GPUs, given the amount of bandwidth going back and forth, and just given the way that these processors function, higher frequencies and higher throughput mean a problem that is nearly an order of magnitude harder to solve when compared to CPUs. The reason for this configuration is pretty simple. The B200 will use TSMC's 4NP process node which is a refined version of the 4N process used by the existing Hopper H100. So we don't really have a lot of details on what TSMC 4NP is, but likely it doesn't offer a major improvement in feature density, which means that if you want a more powerful chip, you're going to just need more power and it'll need to be bigger. And frankly, that's probably why Blackwell is just so massive. And curiously, another big argument I've seen among AI researchers and hardware people is basically that since there hasn't been sort of a fundamental step forward in terms of lithography or kind of how TSMC is making these, it's not clear if that's released three nanometer yet, but what's curious is there hasn't been a huge leap there. So there will be a compromise somewhere to net this amount of performance. Again, we don't have an exact die size. We do know that each die has 24 gigs of HBM3E each with one terabytes per second of bandwidth on each 1024-bit interface, which is kind of interesting. Each H100 previously had six HBM3 stacks of 16 gig, which is bumped to 24 gig in the H200. So basically we know the H100 die was mostly used for memory controllers. And what's interesting is since there's just more memory across less buses now, in theory, more of the die can actually be used for compute as opposed to just switching between memory, which is kind of cool. Now, I'm not going to get too far into the new formats that allow the B200 to maximally perform, which are FP4 and FP8. FP8 was pretty pervasive with the H100. And if we're comparing apples to apples with FP8, the B200 only offers two and a half times more theoretical FP8 compute than the H100 with sparsity. And a big part of that comes from having two chips. So there's a question, you know, how much better really is this? With the new process uh, 4NP from TSMC, 
In theory, a B200 ends up with 1.25x more compute per chip with most number formats that are supported by both the H100 and B200. Removing two of the HBM3 interfaces and making a slightly larger chip might mean compute density isn't even actually that much better at the chip level, but in terms of NVIDIA's new NVHBI interface and a lot of software tooling that wraps this, it's clearly much, much more capable. So all in all, when it comes to training, basically you're seeing a two and a half times performance boost, which is pretty crazy. So even if you're using more power, this is incredible. And in terms of inference, which is a fundamentally different kind of compute when you look at GPUs like this, we're seeing roughly a 10 to 30x improvement depending on the type of data you're pushing through, which is completely insane. And a really interesting thing to note here, um, specifically with GPU data center providers, is that even when they're charging for GPUs, data center providers fully admit that basically they lose money on training and they make more than 50% of their revenue on inference. So clearly, the massive improvement in inference, whether it's audio or video or multimodal as Jensen seems to see the future. This GPU is a massive win for anyone putting them in data centers and also for developers because it means that one GPU just represents more capability and also it means that all the H100s will likely still remain online but be available for less dollars per hour, which for researchers and people like me is pretty cool. Now, one thing that wasn't mentioned with a lot of detail is that there will be different versions of Blackwell available. Initially, they have a stand-in kind of slide-in version, which basically means in any existing HDX, you can slide out a rack of H100s and slide in a rack of B200s, which is pretty cool. Which means, again, that you can, by simply sliding something in and out and replacing it with a Blackwell piece of hardware, you can take the existing incredible NVIDIA switching infrastructure and still use it with the newest GPUs available. NVLink was another huge advancement that was announced here. Basically, they've made another quantum leap forward with switching, which makes connecting all these GPUs and have them act as roughly a single massive GPU even faster and more capable. And, you know, people will say, oh, well, there are all these other companies that are making GPUs. You know, there are, all, there are companies like Grok that are creating dedicated inference pipelines and AMD is still trying to catch up. And I have to say, yes, there are curious competitors, but when you look at the allocation of TSMC, so who can just make chips, when you look at who not only has the GPUs, but has the software to make using these GPUs the easiest of any, uh, not to mention the training and inference infrastructure, and then also when you provide the best tooling right out of the box for data center operators, NVIDIA has now fully enveloped this entire ecosystem which means they're, I would say, easily a five years to a decade ahead of anyone else trying to do this, even if they, in theory, created a, a GPU that could do even one part of what the B200 does even half as well, or even equivalently as well. And again, one of the smartest acquisitions NVIDIA has made in the last two decades was buying Mellanox, and then using all of that purchased IP to create, I would argue, the best switching architecture to connect GPUs to each other and to represent GPUs to researchers in a really simple interface than ever before. There's no more you know, trying to have researchers write code to have GPUs work together at scale. NVIDIA does that with their own engineers and they let researchers do what they do best, which is doing experimental things that push the state of the art forward in the field of AI. Now, among other things, NVIDIA was really big pushing the robotics applications of just AI in general, which I thought was pretty cool. Frankly, I think Robotics is one of the coolest applications of NVIDIA's technology, period. You know, self-driving is cool, um, generative AI is pretty cool, but having robots actually be able to understand language and then translate that into basically path instructions, I think is one of the most powerful things. I've also done a little bit of this with um, my own company in the last month, and it's incredibly powerful. Even working with mechanical engineers, they're stunned at how much easier this makes their job. Another really cool thing is NVIDIA is now building on top of their own transformer engine, which they say is built on Blackwell Tensor Core and Blackwell just Tensor Core inference architecture. This mostly leverages FP6 and FP4, basically saying that they can intelligently translate your transformers into these systems that make basically NVIDIA the best choice and the most efficient choice to run training and inference. Another really curious thing NVIDIA approached was actually containerizing and securing AI. So thinking about how to isolate memory and isolate compute here, 
Because a big thing holding back a lot of enterprise customers from using this is assurances of where leaks can be controlled and where data could be exfiltrated. So looking at um, a sort of hardware or silicon-based solution for this is pretty cool. Frankly, as someone who's done software development for long enough, I generally have a distrust of secure enclaves because they're always just blown wide open within a few years, but this will be very interesting to see if this works. Again, NVLink and NVSwitch was a massive part of their announcement. Decompression Engine was also pretty interesting because you know one thing that's kind of cool, kind of a cheat in the world of AI, is just compressing the data you're shoving into a GPU to actually get um, a model out of. Uh, LZ4, ironically, is one of the still just the fastest uh, algorithms used for this. I use it on my Plex server. And what's crazy is now NVIDIA has created the fastest decompression engine on Earth. And it further enables the immense capability of the Blackwell GPU. Because again, like if you're shoving stuff into, even if you have a ton of memory, if you can compress data you're shoving into it, it means that in theory, you're multiplying the value and the usefulness of that memory. So why not have a decompression engine? The RAS engine is also pretty cool, especially when we just look at operating thousands of GPUs at scale and making sure that we have special systems to do this just for GPUs, not just for servers or CPUs or existing hardware. So all in all, an incredible day from NVIDIA. I'm incredibly excited again to see what we can do with this channel uh, going forward, not only just covering what's coming out of NVIDIA GTC, but also working with next-gen cloud and what we can do with GPUs that they can um, lend us for a very reasonable price. So if you wanna learn more about next-gen cloud, there'll be some links below. If you wanna watch more of our coverage of NVIDIA GTC or there's something you want us to comment on, please let us know in the comments as well. As always, I hope you learned something. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, and share, and I'll see you in the next one.